thank you. How many, just out of curiosity, how many people are going to be following along on a laptop? Handful. Do you guys have the spreadsheet already? If not, we've got uh, some thumb drives we can send around, let you open it up. Um, <clears throat> the idea is going to be getting, kind of rolling up our sleeves, getting our hands dirty a little bit, and seeing this applied. So a lot of uh, you know, complicated mathematical formulas and whatnot. When you start to apply these things in Excel, hopefully you'll get a sense that it, it's not that intimidating to actually create a spectral risk measure. So we'll talk about building it up. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to walk you through that. I'll, I'll kind of take the first bit a little bit slowly as people are getting their machines fired up. But a lot of you are just following along. Um, so we've got this red sheet. We've got uh, some simulated losses. We have 20 outcomes. So uh, we've simulated losses for a kind of make-believe company that's made up of two lines of business. Uh, simulated losses for each of those lines. In column E, we've got just uh, some of those two. So we've got the portfolio result. Each of those outcomes is assigned a, a different probability, some of, you know, repeated probabilities, but each outcome has its own uh, assigned probability. Got some proof to you that we're kind of exhaustive. So we have uh, a complete 100% view of the loss distribution. So this is kind of being taken as a, an input into this. We know what our loss distribution looks like, and we're going to apply spectral measures to it. So we've got these sorted, the 20 outcomes are sorted by portfolio level loss. And because we've got a total probability of one and they're sorted in that way, we've got an easy way to calculate the survival function. So the exceedance probabilities, just a sum of probabilities at that row or and beneath it. And the first move we're going to do in here is going to be something that's very familiar. And Steve talked about it. We're going to calculate an expected value, right? We're used to simulating losses. We average them. Uh, or we multiply the loss outcome by the probability and sum them in this case, since we're talking, so this is a discrete example, obviously, with 20 loss scenarios. Uh, Steve's presentation had integrals, those become sums. Uh, derivatives become differences, so we'll kind of make those comparisons as we go. So first thing we're gonna do in cell E30, if you're following along, is just calculate a portfolio level expected loss as we normally would, and so we'll do a sum product. using the normal probabilities. Oops. And for convenience, I'm going to lock those in and use the portfolio level loss to sum against. Easy, right? So we've done, done that sort of calculation before. Um, we can do the same thing at the, port, at the sub kind of subunit level, so in this case the two lines of business. So I locked in the probabilities, allows me to copy that formula over, and I get uh, line of business two against the provided probabilities for those loss outcomes. Um, what's probably not super surprising to you is that this forms an allocation. So we've got you know the, the sum of the expected losses, is the expected loss of the sum, so I can take 100% of the loss and allocate it back to line of business using this risk measure. This is a, a mean, it's an expected value, that is a risk measure. Uh, so next up, we're going to kind of take the next step into spectral land and talk about uh, a distortion function. If, if that email went around, or are we going to ditch that word? I, I missed it as well. So this is still a distortion function. We kind of took a took a lean towards spectral risk measure over distortion risk measure, um, but this is still uh, the distortion function that kind of lurks in the background. So uh, a little bit about this, if you're looking at the spreadsheet, this is all hard-coded values, so it's as if we kind of pulled them out of thin air. Um, what this represents, and we're going to be working with the same data set today and also tomorrow morning in the, the third session of the deep dive, um, these are calibrated, this is a, a risk measure uh, or sorry, a uh, distortion function kind of constructed off of this industry pricing data. So we had like 10 data points, I think, that corresponded to uh, catastrophe bond prices, 
And we took those points, and we're going to talk about a, a bunch of ways to kind of get a distortion function out of those. The first way is this sort of very naive, you know, I've got a bunch of dots, let me connect those dots. And bearing in mind Steve's restrictions of starting at 0, 0 and ending at 1, 1, we're going to have those points in there as, as two additional points. We've got 12 points, we connect the dots, and where we've calculated our exceedance probabilities in column G, we'll now apply the distortion function by interpolating between those points linearly. So that's all we've done here. We said, here's some market data that we observe. Uh, here, here's how these cat bonds are being priced. This expresses the market's kind of risk preferences with regard to that. So there is in the background a distortion function. We're interpolating between those points, which there's some implications to uh, that we'll get back to later. But that's, that's where these hard-coded values are coming from. Jesse, but, can yeah. we pause for two minutes? Absolutely. Anybody have questions up to this point? Yeah, that's good. If you can use the mic if you have questions. Um, well, I'll ask one. Can you use the mic just because we're being sure. recording? Admittedly, I haven't fully thought this through, but as you were talking about the monotonic property of your curve, um, the arbitrage partially goes away when there's a cost associated with playing the arbitrage, right? So would that then allow you to relax that condition to some extent? So I do question basically about transaction costs. Um, so you've always got an you know, issue with, with dealing with those. Um, so yes, that, that would mess things up somewhat, but you'd still like to think that sort of underlying you, you would like prices that were no arbitrage. But yeah, whether you can practically take advantage of it or not would depend on the degree to which you've got transaction costs. Yeah. Any other questions for now? How are we doing in the back? All right. Moving on. So, <clears throat> got a distortion function. It's been kind of constructed out of these uh, industry pricing points. And in column J, we're looking at uh, you know, delta G of S. So this is just the first difference of what's in column I. So back to Steve's slide with the integrals, um, this would correspond to G prime of S dx. So in kind of discrete land, we're now talking about just a, a difference in the G function. Uh, notice that these G fun the delta Gs, because we're forcing S, or sorry, we're forcing G, our distortion function, to start at zero and end at one. If we have a whole bunch of deltas kind of from start to end, that that sum is exactly one, right? So these are, that's another kind of um, hint that these are really just uh, re-weighted probabilities. These are distorted probabilities that we're now integrating against to get our distorted uh, view, our spectral risk measure. Right, so just like we integrated against G prime dx, we're now going to some product using these distorted or reweighted probabilities. So back down to uh, our expected loss calculation, we're going to repeat that same calculation, except rather than using the original kind of untouched, uh, pure probabilities of these loss scenarios, we're now going to use this these distorted probabilities to do the calculation. So if I was, uh, I think I didn't quite lock everything in, but I'll start, <clears throat> start there and drag stuff around a little bit. Um, I am, whoops, some product of the portfolio level losses, and rather than the untouched probabilities, I'm going to use column J, the reweighted probabilities, right? So this is still, uh, an expected value, but this is now a distorted expected value. I'm saying for each of these 20 loss scenarios, rather than use the probabilities that are kind of true probabilities of those losses, I have used this distortion function, which presumably captures some of my risk preferences. So this is inherently in the market data that we have kind of calibrated to. And I get this new um, distorted expected value. And so that is like, we probably should have done a drum roll before that one, because this is the spectral risk measure, right? So this, this cell. Right, so, so just intuitively, 
why does the probability of the 20th simulation go from one undistorted to roughly four distorted? Like intuitively, why does that happen? For sure. So if you notice, so I'll, I'll kind of talk around that a little bit. So can I take a shot at it? Absolutely. So you remember, remember you said the you got amount and likelihood, right? That's risk preferences, your choice. Okay. This is saying the way we're going to reflect risk is I'm going to pretend that that bad outcome, the 20th outcome, the amount, is way more likely to happen. Now, way more, there's loads of actuarial judgment and risk preference built in, and there's all kinds of formulaic approaches, et cetera, right? 3.9 times. This is what this essentially is doing, is saying, if you trust John Major, I trust him with my life, personally. If I trust, not with my money, though. No. I trust John Major and his magic formula, I'll say, hey, 3.9 times, and if you think about the three boxes, 3.9 times is high. Just keep thinking, just reminding yourself, that's kind of what's going on. Yeah, is it voodoo a little bit? You know, yeah. But this is the part of that there's a black box element to this that only through repetition are we going to see it. Remember, there's nothing magic about the premium to surplus ratios we use or B car formulas. There's a lot about repetition that executives have seen them for a long time that they suddenly feel like, oh, I'm comfortable with that. I know, you know it's like, you know, yeah, through repetition. And, and I, I think we believe they can get there, maybe not right away with something like this, but the idea over time is to get them there. Is that yeah. good? If I could just add to that, the, it's not quite snatched out of thin air though, right? Because we're <laughs> calibrating back to industry pricing for events. So what it's capturing is, if I wanted to offload that risk into the reinsurance market that's sort of basically, you know, it's a 1 in 20 kind of risk, the price for that is four times expected, low 25% loss ratio, right? That's, that's the idea of, of where those numbers are coming from. Yeah. And that's a really good point because many people think in our business, the closest to the, the true arbitrage free of the complete markets with all the trading and so on, that's not us, okay? We're a buy and hold market, very illiquid more like distressed debt, right? We're just, we're a specialty market. But, but one close example that I think Steve was talking about a long time is to say, well, okay, I can reinsure it. So I'm not, we're not saying that you should be internally charging what the reinsurers would charge, but that's one measure people use to benchmark because that's something they can see. You know, that's our version of Bloomberg. They go, okay, well, I can go to whoever and they'll quote me this. So maybe that, at least I know now I have a benchmark of what the price of that is. Yeah, and so two more real quick points to that. Uh, one is we're going to use the same market pricing data. We're going to take a couple different views of it, though, and, and kind of give you two different versions of how to extract that distortion function, which will inherently give you different kind of views of the risk preference that's inherent in those pricing points. And we're also going to eventually tie this back to some financial terms. So we're going to give you a couple different approaches to creating your distortion function, but it is what um, what lies in the shadows here that is, is doing this kind of inflation and deflation of probabilities. So the second point is if you look at the uh, low scenario outcomes up here in the top um, few rows, we're talking about high exceedance probabilities. So these are kind of the more easy to stomach scenarios. We've actually taken these probabilities that were at 10% and we deflated them and we said, you know, I can study these. There's a high exceedance probability. It's you know easier for me to wrap my head around. It doesn't scare me as much. It's kind of the stuff that's happening before you even hit the I care point, let alone the care more. And so we deflated those probabilities to account for the fact that this is kind of easier for us to stomach from a, a risk preference standpoint. So we've calculated our spectral risk measure. And again, I'm going to take that and just copy the formula over to the line of business cells. And um, well, let me say one thing before I get into that, I guess. So notice that the distorted uh, expectation, so our spectral risk measure, is considerably different than the expected value, right? It's a 35, 40% higher. So why is that? Why does that make sense? And that gets back to uh, Steve's point of being kind of above that diagonal. This is risk aversion, right? This is our, our profit load that, that's being factored in here. This is our risk preferences within the distortion function, translating that expected loss into kind of required premium. What do we need to stomach this risk? Um, again, since this is you know, a, a weighted average, it's not surprising probably that we get 
uh, an allocation, what's maybe a little bit surprising to you is that we get a different allocation than we did for expected loss, right? So whereas we were giving line of business 145%, now we're giving line of business 136%. And this represents the, the idea or, or kind of um, it comes about because each of these lines of business are contributing to the, the overall portfolio risk profile in different ways. So the same, same thing, it gets back to kind of deflating probabilities at high exceedance um, probabilities and inflating the likelihood of the low exceedance probabilities. Well, line of business one and line of business two aren't sorted, right? They're not 100% correlated. So they're going to kind of get distorted through this G function in different ways. Well, let, I'm highlighting you because you were crazy enough to ask the question. So now, you're, now you'll be punished for raising it. So, <laughs> Just qualitatively, that change in that allocation. Remember, we shifted the weight. We pretend now that the, the worst scenarios are more likely, and the allocation changes. So, all just knowing that, what what does what does the shift in allocation tell you about the relative con contribution of the lines in which scenarios? Remember, you got these scenarios. Right, sorry, yeah, line two is more risky than line one in the higher scenarios. Right, line means line two, where when we did it on the fully risk neutral basis, which is, remember, expected value is like, hey, I'm neutral to everything, right? I don't care, give me the amounts and probabilities. And this one says, I care more about the worst outcomes, and all of a sudden, the, the focus shifts. So it's really like a lens, I mean, really saying spectral, this is where you can start seeing why it's called spectral. Because it's like you're saying we're shifting our focus on a spectrum, if you will, between zero and one of the probabilities. Great, so one more section in here to cover and then we'll talk about applying this stuff. Um, so in columns L and M, we've got some uh, setup to, to input some reinsurance calculations. Uh, so I'm gonna start off, uh, so the type of reinsurance structure we're looking at here is gonna be a stop loss with a limit or an aggregate excess of loss, however you'd like to categorize it. Um, we're gonna have it attached at 1500 and we're going to give it a limit of 500. And we'll come back and we're going to look at a, a few different structures. But just to give you a sense of what's going on here, uh, this is calculating seeded loss for by uh, outcome or by scenario. And it attaches here, precisely where our portfolio losses exceed the attachment point of 1,500. And the seeded loss caps out at 500, which is what we've set as our limit. Uh, the difference here, between the gross portfolio result and the seeded gives us the, the net retained results. So down beneath that, we've actually calculated, just like we did over to the left, um, expected values using the undistorted probability. So this is just straight expected retained losses, and this is expected seeded losses. And again, no surprise, we get an allocation between retained and seeded. We can then switch gears, and rather than use the, the straight probabilities, we're using the distorted probabilities, and we come up with, again, a spectral risk measure that forms an allocation between uh, seeded loss and retained loss. Different allocation for the, for the same reason, right? The, the seeded losses are, are making up only the, you know, the tail, the way we've got this thing set up, and so they're gonna kind of receive more of that distortion than the full retained losses where we have zero seated. Questions so far? Doing all right? All right, so how do we use these things or where might you use these things? 